Okay, so the reason that people first do drugs or alcohol is not typically because they really want to or because they're really, really curious. It's because their friends do it and they put pressure on them to do it, okay? Most eighth and ninth graders aren't really excited to drink a beer. Like if you just gave it to them in their own room, they probably wouldn't do it. It's their friends that put that pressure on them. So that's how this connects to this unit on drugs and alcohol, is peer pressure is the reason that most people start some of these behaviors. So that, so this lesson is gonna seem like it's about basketball because these are two of the greatest basketball players of all time, but the lesson is about peer pressure and how even the greatest players of all time struggle with peer pressure. Okay, so that's what this is about. Now, these are two of the greatest, these guys are both in the Hall of Fame. This is the most dominant player to ever play basketball. More dominant than Kobe, you know, more dominant than LeBron, more dominant than Giannis, more dominant than anybody. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Okay, now, Will Chamberlain is the only person in the history of professional basketball to do what? Score 100 points, okay? So everything I write down that has an asterisk next to it is an NBA record, okay? So in 1962, he scored 100 points. That is the most ever. That's the most anyone's ever scored in a game. And here's the thing about Will Chamberlain. He could have done it over and over and over again if he felt like it. This is 1962. People were smaller in 1962. He's seven foot one. Oh my God. Okay, people really and truly were smaller. And in the, in the 60s in the NFL, an average starting offensive lineman was like 200 pounds. Now they're 360 pounds. 400 points. Okay, it scored 100 points. Does it look like it? This is an asterisk, okay? So that means it's an NBA record. Um, so that's what he's famous for. He's also famous for something else. This And this connects to our fourth quarter unit deal, which will come up in a little while, but he's, he, there's one other thing he's really famous for that has nothing to do with basketball. Um, Rick Barry. Does anybody know who Rick Barry is? No. I heard of him. Or why he's famous. Probably basketball. He's the greatest free throw shooter in the history of basketball. Oh. And one of the greatest scorers, okay? So he is, I'm going to put free throws, which I'll abbreviate FT from now on. He's the greatest of all time. So 90% for his career Dang. is an NBA record. Free throws? Free throw percentage, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you. He had a season where he made 95% of his free throws. That's an NBA record. He's the greatest free throw shooter in the history of basketball. So what is a free throw? Well, if you look out of the court, there's a line 15 feet from the basket. It's called the free throw line. You get fouled if you're shooting, you go to the free throw line. And you get to shoot typically two, unless you're shooting a three point shot, or sometimes one if you make a basket and you get fouled. Or one of you get one. to shoot two free throws. Can the defense guard you? No. No, that's why it's called a free throw. You can stand there, and catch your breath and look at the basket and take all your time and shoot it. It's, it should be the easiest shot in basketball. For Rick Barry, it was easy. If he took 100 shots, he made 95 of them. Okay. Will Chamberlain free throws for his career was 40%. That is atrocious, okay? That's embarrassing. If you get paid to play basketball, and that is your only job, and you have all day to get better at it, and you can only make four out of 10 when no one is guarding you, you should be ashamed of yourself. That is terrible. It's terrible. And here's the thing about Chamberlain. He was seven foot one, and there's a, so there's a lot of seven foot tall guys in the NBA. A lot of them are really awkward. They're not great athletes, but they play NBA basketball because they're seven one. Chamberlain was a 
great athlete. He was seven foot one. He was jacked. You can look up a picture of him later. He also acted in a lot of movies later. Okay? And he could run and jump faster and higher than anyone he played against. He was unstoppable. Okay? He lost one game his senior year of college in the national championship in triple overtime, 1957, to the North Carolina Tar Heels. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Frank McGuire was the head coach. They beat the best player probably in the history of college basketball in triple overtime. How did teams triple. stop? If everybody else in the court was smaller than this guy, slower than this guy, couldn't jump, how did teams stop him? They, they fouled him. Foul. They fouled him. And what happened when he went to the free throw line? Made four out of ten. He sucked. Two out of five. He was terrible. He was good at everything in basketball except free throw shooting. He led the NBA in assists one year. That's what point guards do. People were criticizing him. Like, you shoot all the time. Well, of course he shoots all the time. He's the best player on the court. <laughs> but he was like, okay, I'll, I'll show you guys. Throw it to me. Pass, pass, pass. He led the NBA in assists. He could do everything you have to do in basketball except the easiest thing. Shaq was the same way. And part of if you ever watch Shaq shoot a free throw, it's like his hand was too big for the basketball. Made it really easy to dunk, but when he was shooting a free throw, it was like he looked like he had a little pebble in his hand. He couldn't figure out how to like balance it. Okay. So that's where we are. I'm gonna so I'm gonna play you clips from this um, podcast and then I'll stop it. You only have to write down what I write down, but if you want to write down other things, you can. If you have a question, ask your questions. Podcast Rally, hosted by Whoa. Christian and Hayes. Is the right thing? All right, here we go. The greatest game of basketball okay. anyone has ever played was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, March 2nd. 1962. Cold, rainy night. Just over 4,000 people in the stands. Philadelphia Warriors versus the New York Knicks. The Sharia Arrows have the good shot they're taking it, but mostly they're setting up the big man. The star of the Warriors was a man named Wilt Chamberlain. No doubt you've heard of him. Seven foot one, 275 pounds. For sheer physical presence, there has probably never been anyone like Will. There are lots of seven-footers who play basketball who are basically on the court purely because they're seven feet tall. They're clumsy and ungainly. Chamberlain was not like that. He was as big as an oak tree and as graceful as a ballet dancer. That season, 1961 to 1962, he ended up averaging more than 50 points a game. NBA that record. record will never be broken. So, March 2nd, Wilt was hungover. He'd been out all night with a woman he picked up at a bar. That's classic Wilt, too. He would later claim to have slept with 20,000 women in his life. Okay, so that's the other thing he's most famous for. Now, oh, man. when we talk about reproductive health in the fourth quarter, I will tell you that sleeping with 20,000 women or 10,000 women or men, partners, whatever, is really unhealthy. STDs. It's unhealthy emotionally, psychologically, and you're bound to get something you don't want to have. Okay? But that's what he was famous for. Um, and, you know, that's people know Will Chamberlain for two reasons. If you ask any sports fan, the first thing they'll say is 100 points, and the second thing they'll say is 10,000 women. That's what he's famous for. Right. And when he said that, Lots of people did the math and said there was no way that was possible given the fact that there were only 24 hours in a day and Will only lived to the age of 63. But even the skeptics were like, well, maybe it's 10,000 or 8,000. It was an argument over whether it was an unbelievably high number or merely an incredibly high number. My name is Malcolm Gladwell. You're listening to Revisionist History, where every week we re-examine the forgotten and the misunderstood. This week's episode is about Wilt Chamberlain's most famous game. Wilt 
He's got the ball. He's going up. He shoots it. So back to the game in question. Chamberlain makes his first five shots and has 23 points at the end of the first quarter. At halftime, he has 41 points. No one's thinking history just yet. But then by the end of the third quarter, he has 69 points and he keeps going and going and going. A hundred points the most anyone has ever scored in a professional basketball game. And here's the most incredible thing about it. He shot brilliantly from the foul line. 20, what do you 28, mean? he made 28 out of 30, 30, 30, 30 or 32. Out yeah. of 32. That's Rick Barry speaking. He was a contemporary of Chamberlain's, also a Hall of Famer, an absolutely unstoppable scorer. I met him at his condo in South Carolina, where he lives part of the year so we can follow his son Canyon who plays basketball for the College of Charleston. Barry is 72, six foot eight inches tall, barrel chest, legs that look like he had special extensions put on them. And that thing that great athletes have and never seem to lose, which is that they kind of glide across the floor, like they have wheels on. A big part of this episode is about Barry, but other people too, because although this sounds like it's going to be a show about basketball, the truth is it's not. It's a show about good ideas and why they have such difficulty spreading. But for the moment, back to Wilt Chamberlain. Chamberlain makes it. He's made 28 out of his 32 shots from the free throw line, 87.5%. The reason that's incredible is that when Chamberlain came into the NBA, he was a horrendous free throw shooter, the worst. He was a man who could excel at virtually every physical feat under the sun, who could score at will with two and sometimes three defenders draped all over his body. But put him all alone, 15 feet from the basket, and he was hopeless. He was shooting 40% from the free throw line. That's terrible. But this season, Chamberlain changes tactics. He starts to shoot his foul shots underhanded. He doesn't release the ball up by his forehead. He holds the ball between his knees and flicks it towards the basket from a slight crouch. And all of a sudden, he's a pretty good free throw shooter. He gets up to more than 60%. And that special night in Hershey, Pennsylvania, he's an incredible free throw shooter. Chamberlain on the line, foul shot up through the air, he has 84. He makes 28 free throws, the most anyone NBA record. In that NBA no history. one has ever made more free throws in a game than me. What Rick Perry will tell you is that shooting underhanded is simply a better way to make foul shots. And he knows that because he... Okay, so Barry, not only is he the best free throw shooter in the history of the NBA, he's the only famous basketball player ever to shoot, or that I'm aware of anyway, certainly in the modern era. Maybe George Mikan or somebody shot underhand, but he's the only player to shoot underhand. So he shot all of his free throws like this. It's a grandma shot. People will call it a granny shot. Do you think the fact that people will call it a granny shot is one of the reasons that NBA players don't do it? Yes. Yes. Yes, because Rick Barry proved that the best way to shoot a free throw is like this, and nobody does it. Rick Barry had three sons playing the NBA. Three. I don't think there's ever been another person who had more than three sons playing the NBA. I'm, I'm only aware of like one or two other groups of three brothers who played in the NBA. He had three sons playing in the NBA. Guess how many of them shot free throws underhanded? None. Zero. Zero. One of them won the dunk contest. A white guy. If you'd ask Rick Barry when he had four little boys walking around the house, is it more likely that one, that one of these kids will win the dunk contest or one of them will shoot the way you shoot? I'm pretty sure he would have said he'll shoot like me. But that's not, Brent Barry won the dunk contest in the mid-90s. There was like a decade where the dunk contest was terrible. It's really good right now. It was really good in 2000 when I was in high school and Vince Carter, yep. to me, the single greatest dunk contest performance of all time. It was good in the 80s when Dominique Wilkins and Michael Jordan were going at it, and in the 90s, it sucked. 
D. Brown won a dunk contest by dunking like this, and he clearly could see. That's all he did. He just jumped and dunked and kind of put his arm over his ass. That's terrible. We have about 20 kids at the school who can do that. Okay. Um, I can do that. All right. You, before I got this boot on, um, I could do that. So that's bad. And that's when Rick Barry won the dunk contest. But still, you think one of them, Dad's the greatest free throw shooter of all time. We all play in the NBA. You think at least one of them would shoot like this, but they didn't because guys think that's how either grandmothers shoot it specifically or just girls generally. I can tell you this, if you come back to Broughton in 10 years and my daughter's playing here, and then a few years later my son, if they're playing basketball, they're gonna be shooting underhand free throws. I'm never gonna let them out of the house. <laughs> it's just a better way to shoot. Now Rick Barry's gonna explain why it's easier to make a shot underhand. Yeah. Now. You wouldn't do this in, in the actual game. Why would you not do it while people are guarding you? Because you'd never get a shot. They, you know, just, they block your shot like this. Okay, there's a reason you shoot up here when someone's guarding you. But you don't, no one can guard you at the free throw line. He was one of the greatest foul shooters of all time. Maybe the greatest. I missed nine and 10 in one season and nine in another. In the whole season. To put that in perspective, LeBron James, the greatest player of the current basketball generation, typically misses about 150 free throws a season. Rick Barry would miss nine or 10. Okay, nine or 10 in a season. Now I don't know how many games there were when Barry was playing. Now there's 82 games in NBA season. And LeBron misses 150. But that's not bad, that's like two missed free throws a game, right? That's, he's a good free throw shooter. Barry scored the way LeBron scores. It wasn't like he wasn't going to the free throw line. He went to the free throw line and he never missed. So if Cham I don't know how many years Chamberlain played, but let's say he played a thousand NBA games, which is not out of the question. Okay, that would be a little over 10 years. I bet in half of those games, he missed more than 10 free throws in a game. Because people fouled him all the time, it was the only way you could stop him. And if you only make 40% of your free throws and you go to the line 20 times, well, you just missed, what, 12 free throws? Yeah. Math work? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Rick Barry had seasons where he didn't miss 12 free throws. A game, a season. That's crazy. I think I shot 93.5 or something, a 94.7, something like that. And Rick Barry only shot underhanded. From a physics standpoint, okay. it's, think about it's this. a much better way to shoot. As he explains Less it. things that can go wrong, less things that you have to worry about repeating properly. Imagine or yourself doing this. Successful. But the other thing is, is that who walks around like this? So he's saying nobody yeah, walks around with their This is not a natural position. Yeah. When I shoot underhanded free throws, where are my arms? We walk like this. Hanging straight down the way they are normally. So shooting and from so here. And so I'm totally and completely relaxed. It's, easier it's not in a situation where I have to worry about my muscles getting tense or tight. And then the shot itself, it's a much softer shot. So many of my shots, even if they're a little off, they hit so nice and soft and they'll still fall on the soft basket. Bounce. Much softer touch. Yeah. And so you, you you have a little bit more margin for error. Some of those shots that are a little bit offline have a much better opportunity of going into the basket than when you shoot overhand. Okay, so when so when you, if I coached basketball for 10 years, and if I was gonna teach you to shoot a free throw, I would not have taught underhand because I hadn't heard this episode yet. <laughs> now that I have, it's changed the whole way I think about stuff. I would have taught you, okay, we, uh, you might have done this with Coach McGuire and Jim. Beef, balance, eyes, elbow, follow through, okay? All of that stuff, getting your elbow right underneath the ball instead of letting it um, kind of veer out, getting the right backspin, having it come off your fingers the right way is hard to duplicate over and over again the same way. Which is why even the best free throw shooters in the NBA don't hit nearly that many of their free throws. There hasn't been a, an ACC player to make 90% of his free throws. I don't think even JJ Redick, who was the best when I was growing up, did it. Okay, that's a ton of free throws. This is a lot to get right. This is really easy to repeat. Even without any practice, you guys can go out and make a bunch of free throws like this, okay? The thing that makes the ball go in after it hits the rim is backspin. It makes it die on the rim. You can get backspin with your wrist. You can get a lot more backspin if you use both wrists, okay? So I would challenge you to go, just to go try it. It's also a lot easier to make the ball go straight when you have a ball, uh, a hand on each side of the ball, then when you try to put one kind of in the middle and you're, okay, does that make sense from just a physics? Yep. Okay. 
So Wilt Chamberlain switches to a better shooting technique. It pays off in the greatest basketball game ever played. He's playing the way that Rick Barry proved basketball players ought to play. Then something mm -hmm. incredible happens. Wilt Chamberlain stops shooting underhand, and he goes back to being a terrible foul shooter. Okay. That's what this episode, so that's what this lesson is about. So in 62, 63, okay, Pete, where's my black marker? In 60, so 61, 62, he scores 100 points in a game and he shoots 60% from the free throw line. Underhand. In 62, 63, he goes back to shooting overhand and he goes back to being a 40% shooter. For a guy who makes as many free throw or takes as many free throw shots as Will Chamberlain does, you're talking about hundreds of points that he didn't score. And I don't know how many, I don't know what their record was that year, but you're probably talking about dozens of games that they lost that they would have won if he had shot underhand. That's crazy. The whole reason professional athletes do what they do is to score and to win. That's the only point of professional sports. High school sports, to me, are first about building character, helping you know, teach boys and girls to be good people, and second about winning. They don't care how terrible of a person you are in the NBA, or the NFL, or Major League Baseball. There's a lot of terrible people playing professional sports. As long as they win, everything's fine. His job is to win, his, his team was losing games because he wouldn't shoot the way he knew how to shoot in terms of what works best. Why? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. <laughs> he said in his autobiography, he said, I felt, you need to write this down, like a sissy. I know I was wrong. I know I was wrong. I know I was wrong. It's one thing to make a mistake if you don't know any better. He knew better. He was an awful free throw shooter. He switched to a better way of shooting. He became a decent free throw shooter. Nobody improves 20% from the free throw line. Nobody. Guys don't go from 70% to 90% or 60% to 80% in one season. That never happens. That's a huge improvement. They won more games. He scored more points. He scored 100 points. If he missed even one free throw, one more free throw, if he'd gone 27 for 32 or 26 for 32, he wouldn't have scored 100 points. And despite all of that, he felt like a sissy, and he went back to being an awful free throw shooter. We all do things we know are wrong because people pressure us to do the wrong thing. We all do things we know are wrong because people put pressure on us or because we don't want people to laugh at us or make strange faces at us. We like to fit in. Humans are designed to fit in. In some ways, our lives depend on fitting in. If you're a caveman and you can't get along with the other caveman and they put you out in the snow, you die. Yeah. Right? So we have a strong incentive to want to fit in. That's why peer pressure works. And peer pressure can be positive or negative. Your friends can get you to do the right thing just as easily as they can make you do the wrong thing because we, most of us, even though we're not seven feet, one inches tall and great athletes, most of us are like Will Chamberlain. We'll just do whatever it takes to fit in. Very few of us are like Rick Barry. Rick Barry just didn't care. I always assume that Rick Barry must have always shot this way from the time he was a little kid. He didn't. Rick Barry was probably the best high school basketball player in the country at his age. And his father, when he was a junior, said, you know what? And he was a pretty good free throw shooter, 70%, which in high school is pretty darn good. Okay, Roy, if you're watching this, very few Carolina players this year shoot 70% from the free throw line. Facts. Facts. So he was already pretty good. And his dad said, you know, you'd make more if you shot under him. He said, no way, people will make fun of me. His dad said, they won't make fun of you if you make everyone. So he switched. Okay, so let's think about, this, this is for Roy, Carolina basketball. I'm, the, I'm a die-hard Carolina basketball fan. Let's go, okay? And I, They've lost six games this year by 
three points or less. I think it's really two points or less because I can't remember a game where they lost by three. In every one of those games, if they had made one more free throw, they would have won the game. Oh, dude. Okay? I went to the Clemson game to see Roy Williams break Dean Smith's record. They were ahead by 10 points with two minutes left and lost because they turned the ball over and they missed free throws. I was at the Duke game, 10 rows up. They were ahead by 14 <laughs> points with four minutes left, and Duke's mm. best player fouled out, and they lost because Duke started doing what? This is what all basketball teams do when they're behind at the end of the game. Fouling. 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 They make Carolina go shoot free throws every time. What's up, Cavs? Never seen We need to shoot underhand free throws next year, Coach. Right. Good.